Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 245. People have forgotten how to tell a story. Stories don't have a middle or an end anymore. They usually have a beginning, and that never stops beginning. Steven Spielberg. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Blackbox. Blackbox is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Today's show is also sponsored by Studio Unknown. Studio Unknown is a crack team of audio post professionals known for quality sound on any indie budget. Whether you need a lush surround sound mix or a quick festival submission pass, Studio Unknown can help you with all of your post sound needs, from sound design and mix to Foley ADR and even a custom score. Contact Studio Unknown and mention the Indie Film Hustle podcast and you'll get 50% off one day of ADR or 10% off your complete post sound package. Just go to studiounknown.com. Now, today on the show, we have Caleb Price, who is the director of a new film called Connect. It's a documentary starring Kirk Cameron of the 80s hit show, Growing Pain. And Caleb and Kirk got together to make a movie called Connect, which is a movie about helping parents understand social media and navigating the social media world in regards to their kids and and how insane it is and what's going on and a lot of the abuse that's happening. But that's not the main reason I wanted Caleb on the show. Caleb and Kirk have been able to leverage a service called Fathom Events to be able to sell uh, movies and distribute them theatrically in a very unique way. And it's, a, I think, a good opportunity for you guys to hear how they did it, how they did the marketing for it, what's the what's it like working with Fathom Events. And I'm not going to tell you too much about Fathom Events because we're going to go deep into it in the interview, but it is a unique way to get your movie into theaters uh, and get a theatrical and a large theatrical release, not just, you know, 10 theaters. It's going to be a minimum of like 100 to 200 theaters, if not more, if you're able to make a deal with Fathom Events. So it's a very interesting way uh, and it's just another way, another avenue, another revenue stream that you can throw on to help you make your money back on your movie release. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Caleb Price. I'd like to welcome to the show Caleb Price, man. Thank you so much for jumping on the show, man. No problem, Alex. Thanks for having me. So um, first of all, before we get into your um, the distribution model and, and, and your movie Connect, how did you actually get started in the business? I'm glad you asked that because you always ask you ask your guests that in the beginning, and yes. they always have different stories. Well, um, I feel like my my journey into this business might be similar to yours in that at a very young age, I remember specifically my parents had one of those old camcorders. Do you remember when the Sony camcorders were that you you that's, held and it was like the, a giant screen? Yes, like I the had. whole thing was just mm-hmm, a screen, and mm-hmm. you know what I mean. And mm-hmm. like, yeah. that was my first camera. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So my first camera, yeah. I remember my parents when I was in middle school said, Hey, anytime you want to use the camera, you can. And I I can't explain it to you, Alex, and it's probably how all of your listeners feel, Mm -hmm. but like a switch switched in my brain. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this is so cool. And I remember I had my friends come over. I'm like, guys, we can use the camera. And they were just like, So, you know what I mean? Like (laughs) so that but I was like, but we can tell stories now and we can like we can make our own stuff. And so that's that's when it happened. But my dad was a firefighter. Um, My mom was a stay-at-home mom. No connections to the industry whatsoever. So I did what a lot of kids did, which your podcast is actively preaching against, praise (laughs) the Lord, is 
I took out an amor- enormous oh, amount of debt. Oh no, you didn't. Oh. <laughs> and, I, and I went to I went to film school. Oh, and, okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'll be paying. I'm paying off that debt right now. I'm but, sure. Uh, you, I'm sure so you that's, are. I'm sure. So you there are. you go, Alex. That's how that happened. I <laughs> I didn't know. Um, you know, it, it uh, clearly like you know, it's not a normal career path. So it was very. And my parents were in the, or I think the early 2000s is probably when the the most amount of kids and teens probably took out the biggest loans. Because I feel like now people like you are kind of getting the word out like, hey, you don't, you should not go into debt for this type of industry. And I feel like there's more people preaching that now. Mm Mm-hmm. Like not just film school, like but other schools too. Like my gosh, like don't spend one hundred and thirty thousand dollars to go to Harvard to learn how to weave baskets. It doesn't. Like it, it makes it makes it, no, it makes no financial sense. Like my my wife's a social worker, and she you know she went to school and 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 she, a little bit of debt, but nothing crazy uh, to get her master's degree. Um, and she she was having her interns come in from USC, and they had a hundred and forty thousand oh. dollars <coughs> in in debt. For oh. a social worker, oh my and gosh. I'm going. It doesn't make financial sense. So, as a filmmaker, if you're going to go to film school, if you can go to like your community college, you can get a. You, you get my my film education cost me twenty thousand bucks. Okay, oh. that's that's fair. Yeah, that, that's fair. And I yeah, where, where'd and you where'd you where'd you go? I went to Full Sail. Okay, I've heard really, really good things about them. Actually. I went to Full Sail back in when it was only like five. The film department was only five or six years old, and it's not what it is today. Now it's like Disneyland, but right. back then it was not. And now it costs like eighty grand or a hundred grand or something like that to go. That's oh, ridiculous. Nope. nope. But but that made sense for me. Um, but if you come out of film school, and I know these guys, I know them. I know many guys that do this that they have a hundred, eighty, hundred, hundred twenty thousand dollars in debt. And they're literally tape, you know, they're dubbing tapes or, um, you know, they're working as, uh, you know, editors in, you know, like just grinding, just grinding, not doing their own stuff, but grinding. Um, And they're 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 never going to get out of that. It's like having a mortgage, but with no house. (laughs) Oh, a hundred percent. Like I was just listening. You just did an episode recently, and I was glued to it. What'd you do? You did the collection collections agency guy. Oh yes, yes. He's okay, awesome. so so like, I th- I did not take that for granted because I was like, so this type of information, how this guy is breaking it down for Alex on what this guy like, yeah. people pay a lot of money to just learn that this type of service exists. Yeah, <laughs> like that's what film school was. So yeah, not to get way off track, but yes, I went to film school. I went to, <laughs> and here's oh here's the kicker. Here's here, this is gonna make you throw up. Uh-huh. So, so I did the, all the stuff, right? The twenty thousand dollar loans, twenty twenty twenty. Sure. Um, I think I graduated like around eighty six, ninety thousand dollars in oh, debt. God bless. I went, yeah, I went to Brooks Institute in Ventura. I don't even know if you've heard of it. Probably no, not. Nope, <laughs> never heard of it. Sorry. Oh, it's okay because they went bankrupt and they closed. Of course so. they did. Of course they did. Why would they? Uh, but, but you still uh, owe the money. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is the worst part. So I still owe money. This other brookie I ran into a couple years later. He's like, yeah, check this out. So the way loans work, they only they only the banks take out insurance policies on their loans to cover them in case a school goes under mm-hmm. because you're paying for a degree and if your classes are non transferable, which almost ninety eight percent of film schools are non transferable credits, right? Um, you get all your money refunded because they see it as oh you're working towards a degree and now you can't get it. Mm-hmm. So this kid, no joke, he was one semester away from graduating. Oh god, that's awesome. Took all the loans, like maxed them out. All yeah. of them. All right. School closes. He gets the letter. You can't go to school anymore. Boom, gets a letter from all his loans. All of your loans are forgiven. None of them have to be paid back. So he got the entire education. Pretty much. <laughs> for free. It's like, you know ah. what? And you know, sometimes you're just born under the lucky star. What can you do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But so that, there's your answer. That's how I got into this business and been stumbling around and trying my best. And hey, man, look, you know, sometimes, uh, look, when I, when I went to film school, there was no education. There was no other options. There was no YouTube. There was no, right. there yeah. was nothing. There was nothing to teach you film other than going to film school. Uh, today is a different world. Like it just totally. makes, makes no sense to go nope. unless, mm. you, again, if it's affordable, go for it. But, you know, or if you can get into a big school like USC, the connections alone are worth yeah, it sometimes. That's that's a strong I mean you make a really strong case for that. I, I still would say to your listeners, all your teens out there, go if you can get into USC, 
I would at least flirt with the idea sure. and, and see, but, but I would strongly recommend don't just throw, throw it up to the wind and say too expensive, just taking out loans. You can, you can almost always figure something out. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You know, yeah, there's a lot take, of, there's a lot of financial aid. There's a lot, there's a lot of stuff that you can do to go to a big school like that. But I know, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking there next week. I'm oh, cool. doing, I'm doing a, t- uh, um, they invited me to do some lecturing there and I've been to USC a few times now and it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's USC. It's That's amazing. The- but is it worth 150 grand? If you don't have 150 grand? No. Right. You know, so that's that's the thing. Anyway, we have gone way off topic. Let's yeah, sorry. Get, let's get back on. Um, back on. All right. So your film Connect is a, a documentary that stars Kirk Cameron. Can you tell me a little bit about the film? Yeah, sure. So Connect is about um, social media and technology <laughs> in this generation and basically how parents and adults for the first time are really starting to wake up to the fact that it's not just a harmless technology and it is a completely different world, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook – not LinkedIn, but yeah, <laughs> the other Twitter. ones. Yeah, Twitter. Twitter. There you go, Twitter. And <clears throat> giving your kid, giving a the the studies are out now. The average age of a kid first gets a cell phone now is ten years old. Mm-hmm. Um, a smartphone. We're talking full access iPhone or sure. Android stuff. A ten year old. So um, it's basically the, when we talked to a psychologist, he said that's kind of the equivalent of taking a 12 year old or a 16 year old, driving them to Las Vegas, <laughs> giving them ten thousand dollars in a fake ID. And just being like, I'll see you later. Like, it's almost the equivalent with wow. the amount of stuff that's out there. And um, so that's it's the longest short of it. So the documentary goes into that. But instead of it freaking parents out or freaking, freaking us out to like, oh, just take the phones away. It's more like, no, this is, this is a, um, we live in the most amazing time in history. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can connect to anything and anyone at any moment. Mm-hmm. However, doing it unguided, unbridled, um, your kids are going to go down a very dark path. They're their Can brains be. are going their yeah. their brains are going to be underdeveloped mm-hmm. they're going to their social skills will be zilch to non-existent mm-hmm. um they won't know how to have long lasting effective relationships friendships you know r- romantic relationships mm-hmm. and their um the the de- the phones are literally rewiring their brains so we go on this journey with Kurt Cameron who's a who has six kids so he's learning this stuff himself so he kind of talks to these experts so we talk to a brain surgeon um we talked to some therapists, some psychologists, some pastors, a lot of parents, interview a bunch of uh, kids in their 20s. Um, so yeah, that's basically – and it's the whole, the whole thing and, – uh, uh, and we'll probably get into this because this is really helpful – is I made it for a very specific target audience. Yeah, yeah, I, and, and yeah we'll definitely get into that. But, uh, but let me ask you, so what was the distribution plan? Like when you, when you sat down with Kurt and like, okay, we're going to go make this movie – did you guys already know that you were going to go down the distribution plan you went to, or you did you go? Did you try to go <clears throat> to a um, to a traditional distributor because you obviously have some star power and in a very lucrative uh, niche that um, you guys are going after? So just curious. So here's what happened. So obviously, so I'm 30, and my the movie I want to make is not was not necessarily a documentary for parents about social media technology. <laughs> and so what I would say is, and this answers your question, is to a lot of your, your listeners, keep your passion project, but keep your peripheral vision open because your peripheral vision is where the opportunities are going to happen. And if you don't take them because you just have the movie you want to make, mm-hmm. good luck ever getting to do anything in this business. Absolutely. So, 100%. so what happened was a mutual friend introduced me to Kirk. Um, the stars kind of aligned as they say, and he, he was looking for the new media guy. So he put me on staff, we're hanging out. And then he actually had done some fathom events before, Mm -hmm. um, with documentaries and documentaries do really well traditionally as fathom events because the, um, well, if, before if you, before we continue, let's talk, please tell everybody what is Fathom Events. Oh, right. <laughs> so all we talk about is Fathom around here, so I forget. Sure, sure. So, uh, so anyone can just go, just Google Fathom Events. But essentially, Fathom is a different way to broadcast things and events, entertainment into movie theaters. Traditionally, Fathom is live events. So think a big UFC fight, um, a big boxing, the fight, opera, right? Uh, yeah. Tons of opera. No. So much opera. <laughs> um, so over the, so Kirk was actually the first one several years ago. He's like, I want to do a documentary about the founding of America. Um, they approached him and said, Hey, we're looking to do actual regular, you know, movies. Uh, movies. 
uh, especially with a niche. Mm -hmm. And so that's how that relationship started. So to people listening, Fathom does do regular movies. The same night that Connect aired in theaters, Fathom was also airing a a movie called Primal Rage. Mm -hmm. Um, Luckily, totally different audience because it's about a big (laughs) foot that like tears people's heads off. So I wasn't too concerned about yeah, cr- cannibalizing your audience, if you will, sir. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's what Fathom Events is, Alex. So it's a it's a new way to get into theaters. Usually, um, actually, not just usually, but you you need to have something special with your movie mm-hmm. to to legitimize it being a Fathom event. So yeah, so, well, so what is the process? How does like a filmmaker go uh, approach them, pitch them? How does it work? Um, well, so back to the peripheral vision thing. Uh, Kirk already had the relationship with Fathom. Mm-hmm. So he said, I want to do a new project for Fathom. Mm-hmm. So he already had that relationship with them. Okay. However, I do know they're always looking for content. So you can't necessarily, um, you can even just go to the website and like start emailing them. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but you have to have an audience. You need to have some sort of audience. Kirk Cameron has a very loyal Christian sure. mom, Christian mom and dad audience. Mm-hmm. So um, you need a niche audience. And you basically, you yeah, you can just email them at their website at Fathom Events, and then, um, but you can't just have a just just a movie. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you need to have like for us, Kirk did uh, a special welcome message at the beginning, and he did this like special thing at the end where the audience got a discount on um, Circle. It's this device that helps you monitor your kids' social media stuff, mm-hmm. and that then that kind of made it a Fathom event. Does that make sense? It's kind of like okay, so all right, so because I'm trying to I'm trying to grasp because I've heard of Fathom events because I've been in a movie theater in the last ten years, so <laughs> I, I I know what they are, um, and I've seen like you know the room and like a couple other movies <laughs> that do like Fathom events um, because their audiences are big, but I always wonder like how do you approach them with like an independent film? So perfect example, and I'm going to use myself as an example. I have an audience, not nearly as big of an audience as Kirk does. Um, but I have an audience and I have a movie that is um, aimed at that audience, which is uh, the new movie on the corner of Ego and Desire. Is that something that you could literally walk in to to them and go, hey, look, this is what we've got. We've got kind of a niche here. We've got an audience. Does this even make sense? Yes. And here's what I would say for you that works in a immense amount of your favor. Mm-hmm. Uh I just have to think if uh, legally I can say this. I'm just going to say it anyways. Hopefully I'm going to get fired. Uh-huh. So basically um, – Fathom is based in Colorado. So if you, Alex Ferrari, approach them with your film on the corner of Ego and Desire, mm-hmm. especially, and you kind of show the numbers of your website mm-hmm. and, Podcasts you know, I, and all that stuff. you got the podcast, all this stuff, you know, compile it into a pitch. Um, it doesn't cost you anything up front. Yeah, I've so, heard that. I've heard that. That's, so that's, that's, public, that's public information. So that part is humongous mm-hmm. because, um, like it, I mean, it doesn't cost you anything. That's now here. Right. Now here's the downside. Mm-hmm. Um, so Kirk, even the first one he did was, I think, only in three or four hundred theaters. Mm-hmm. Sold all. Uh, this is years ago, right? Monumental mm-hmm. sells out all those theaters. So they give him a, a quote encore date, mm-hmm. and then they bumped up the theater count. Mm-hmm. So the downside for 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 you, since you haven't worked with Fathom before, is mm-hmm. they would look at your film, look at your audience, like, yeah, this is cool. Let's work out a date. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're probably only going to get two to three hundred theaters. That's a shame. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, it's a shame. Only two or three hundred. I'm walking. Uh, but, no, of course, but think, of course. Of, but think about it. They're not going to give you any money. Uh-huh. Um, you're the, they'll you make a you make a marketing video for them. They'll run it in their you know their theater stuff. They'll mm-hmm. run it on their page. But you're kind of in charge of marketing almost entirely on your own. Of course. Um, so there's that. And you got to think, yes, it's two to, two to 300 theaters, but it's only one night. Not only is it only one night, it's one time at that night. Not only is it one time that night, it's going to be a Tuesday or Thursday. Got it. So those things do kind of stack up against you. But like you said, it's like, look, if I can make a hundred thousand dollar film or a $50,000 film mm-hmm. and, uh, go to fathom this way, the chances of recouping that are, are, are relatively high. What is the, do, are you allowed to tell you what the cuts are or is that something that's uh, quiet? Like, is, is it a 50, 50, 70, 30 or is there anything like that? Um, I can say, well, the, I mean, the, I'm sure Kurt has a, a better deal than everybody else, but I'm just curious. Um, I do know. Well, yeah, so here's the weeds. You, you have to split it a couple times because okay. there's, so fathom did a big chunk of the legwork for you and, and got it into the theater. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, which you didn't pay for. Mm-hmm. 
So the theater chains take their cut first. And I don't know, like, I'd have to look the exact number, but I mean, a theater chain cut is anywhere from 30 to 50%. Fair enough. Off the top. Um, and then Fathom takes their percentage after that. Right. So I- We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So once Which, you get 50% off, let's say take 50% off a dollar. So now it's 50 cents. And now out of that 50 cents, you have now a new 100%. And then Fathom takes 30 or 40%. And then you're left with whatever's left. So you're left with maybe 20% of, of, of the take. Uh, yeah. So, so you're seeing it. It's a, yes. Yes. You. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, which is not bad for a theatrical release. And if it's only one night, it's one hey, it's, time, one night. So that's the tough part. Yeah. It's one time, one night. But even if you could make a little bit of money that night, that's not bad. And it's a theatrical. Right. I think a good way to look at it uh, is have your, have your secondary plan ready to go, your mm-hmm. home entertainment. Mm-hmm. Like um, this actually probably would, could really work for on the corner of ego and desire. I don't know. Like, you you have the times set up when you would like it to release on like you could use distributor if you wanted or whatever sure, sure. And have it ready to go on those but make sure it's not available on those until you can do the theater release mm-hmm. and then i believe in the fathomy stuff of mm-hmm. your theater release mm-hmm. you can you can say hey it's coming out on home video on these days or or you might even be able to pull it off where it's available like the next night yeah sure of course the, the next then, night, right um fathom is pretty pretty uh sticky with um, what they want you to not say about when else it is available. Fair enough, fair enough. Like that makes sense. So that was the distribution plan. So it was never a conversation about going through a, a, a traditional distributor. Uh, well, we had a traditional distributor, uh, Provident Films, which is owned by Sony Pictures. Mm-hmm. But yeah. you mean you mean a traditional like path, right? Like, right, like, like a tra- like, so you have a traditional. So you do have a, a traditional distribution path besides the Fathom of events. Yeah, and I can talk a little bit about that um, please. Cause I just got hit with all these deliverables. And oh, yes. Fun, fun. Bro. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> it's not fair. You know I know. <laughs> so the, the plan uh, was we'll do a Fathom event. We ended up being in the theaters four nights, mm-hmm. um, which was, was awesome. Uh, by the way, I looked up how much you made. According to Box Office Mojo, it's over $830,000. And that was just the two nights. They didn't report the other two nights. So you've done which well. I, which I will yeah, – so <laughs> yes, so here's that. What, so here's what's good about that. That gives you some. That gives you some baseline numbers because um, I can tell you with the other two nights we were pushing closer to a million, maybe a little lower. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you know the theater chains off the top, anywhere from thirty to sixty percent. So whittles so, it way down. <laughs> so then, no. So like, then, let's say you pulled in two million on this, or a million and eight. You really are going to take home probably two to three hundred grand. That that sounds more more correct, and then think how much money you had to drop in marketing. Yeah, and that's the thing. How much how much do you spend on marketing? Um, so I don't know if I'm. They gave me those numbers. I'm not supposed to, I'm supposed to talk about them, but I can definitely say for a Fathom sure. event, you're going to see people spending anywhere from nothing. You know, they're just hoping on the word of mouth. Like I bet you, Alex, you probably would have a good shake at not spending too much if you just like redirected all of your social platforms for a couple of weeks and just did like a blitz. Mm-hmm. Um, but most people will probably spend anywhere from a hundred to five hundred thousand dollars on marketing. Oh God! Yeah, that's not happening. Um, yeah. But- <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, that's those are the numbers I've heard from Fathom events. And then Kirk was, I mean, Kirk hustled like crazy. He did Shows. the Steve Harvey show. He sure. was they had him on the Today Show three times. They did um, oh, what they do? And then lot, all the affiliates, you know, ABC LA and like New mm. York. And then they had him on the Doctor Oz show. Um, which ties in to, uh, I know you wanted to talk about distribution, but sure. when you're, when you're like to the, the tribe, as you say, when you're looking at your film, mm-hmm. man, I know you've talked about this a lot, but you've got to think of that target audience. Mm-hmm. Um, because if we would have just made a fun, let's call it just like a faith based sure. adventure film with Kirk, mm-hmm. he's not, he's not going on the today show. No, nope. like they won't have him on there. Like, why would we have Kirk Cameron on here to talk about his religion? Right. Obviously, I, you know, to me personally, I think that's deeper than that, but they don't. Right. However, oh, Kirk Cameron's got six kids. Kirk Cameron's pretty famous, and he's doing something about social media and technology and how parents need to wake yep. up. Yep. That's Boom, enough. Boom. You, now you've got a niche. And now Steve Hart, like, he had never been on the Steve Harvey show or Dr. Oz. Right. But, but because it was such a niche topic, they wanted him. And, it, and, it, and he kind of broadened his base a bit. 
by doing Ex- by doing exactly this. as opposed to just being in his niche, he kind of opened himself up a little bit in that. That's very exactly. It's very very fascinating. Um, because I was I was going to ask you about the marketing. So you and you were in charge of all the marketing. Uh, so Provident Films has a marketing director, and we worked with a guy that you had on your show. Mm-hmm. Um, because this industry turns out is super Kyle? small. Kyle. Uh, yeah, we, I worked with Kyle and uh, Evan. But, sure. Uh, they're both part of Ribo, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kyle's, Sorry, I don't, I, Kyle's good I, people. I don't know if you want me to say other company names on here because oh, I, I know they pay for marketing and all that. So <laughs> this fight, it's all so good. Yeah, I know. We we worked with Ribo, but um, yeah, that's another good thing that filmmakers need to understand. So even though like I so I wrote the whole I wrote the movie and then I um cross referenced pieces of it with Kirk, make sure he liked it, and then he would give his you know input. Um, I looked up all the experts and like got it all kind of squared away and organized. Um, but on a, any, any production I'm finding that's under 2 million, mm-hmm. heck it could be even under 3 million. The director, if you're, your job is extremely lengthy. Mm-hmm. Like, so after I finished the final cut, we used a studio in LA to do the, the editing. I, I mean, I must've made 45, 50 different types of trailers and mm-hmm. it just never stops. Mm-hmm. So to answer your question for marketing, we work with Ribo Media. And they handled all the social media stuff. Plus, I have to work with Kirk Cameron organically. Mm-hmm. Um, Kirk Instagram, Facebook page. Then I have to work with all of the third outlets, which is the Today Show, uh, Steve Harvey, blah, 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 blah. What they want and the, and the, the, the stuff exa- that they want to promote. Exactly. Right? And then I have to think, okay, this is Steve Harvey's show. People, people like Steve Harvey because he's fun. He's funny. Probably need to give them a little some content that has got some humor in it. Dr. Oz, pretty serious, pretty heavy, talking about the phones and how it's, you know, causing kids neurolog- to kill themselves. Yeah, the neurological stuff, right. Yeah. So um So yes, you gotta so customize to- each outlet. You have to someone has gotta edit that. Someone's yep. gotta put that package together. Someone's gotta put it on on a I, I guess a tape, or would you just send a file over nowadays? I don't uh know. yeah, yeah. So again, back to the day we live in is so much easier. Um they they always want pro res. The higher the level of show, mm-hmm. the more demanding their uh thing is i did learn um this is also for your tribe out there whenever you make something just always when it's finalized and you like it always have a split track ready to go Mm -hmm. um which i didn't know Mm -hmm. they all these places wanted split tracks which basically means they want all your music and sound effects panned hard right and they want all of the voices and dialogue panned hard left because they they on there and need to yeah didn't know that (laughs) put their music on if they want to put their music on and bumpers and things like that yeah and just have more control so yeah exactly and um, now you were just talking about deliverables. What are a few of those deliverables? Just so I know we're talking, we're supposed to be talking about distribution, but I, this is part of distribution is that deliverables list. And since you just got that list, um, what are a few things that they're asking for? Okay, so here's the deal. So when 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 y'all uh, make a movie, a lot of times it feels like a ProRes four two two HQ export is 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 enough. And you're 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 right and wrong at the same time. I found out. <laughs> So I so we're dealing with the orchard. Oh I, yeah, better. of course, orchards. Very so um, this this industry is so weird, man. Like so, Provident funded the project, who's owned by Sony, mm-hmm. and then I bought a ton of Sony gear, which is also owned by Sony. Mm-hmm. And then the orchard is a, a subsidiary of Sony, who's also doing the distribution separate through with Provident. So it's like a, this, and then Sony Pictures owns everything. So it's like this, yeah, it's just crazy. Yeah. So, but the higher up uh, you go. It, with the distributor, like the orchard is a pretty top level. I have never worked with them before until sure. this. So their deliverables are much higher. So here's an example. I get this email here. They want the video master to be Apple ProRes HQ. So it's 422 sure. HQ. Fair enough. Um, and then, of course, they want, you know, make sure your audio is 48, 48 kilohertz, 16 bit audio, which is pretty ta- standard. Sure. Here's, and here's the stuff I didn't know. They need three versions they want texted, clean, and textless. Of course. Which, I, okay, so I I had never been asked for this before. So uh, if 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 past Caleb could listen to future Caleb talking to Alex, this would have saved uh, te- me some time. Textless, of course. People don't but, think about textless at all. No, and so I had to. We had to pay more money. I had to go back to the post house. Mm-hmm. Text did is title cards, credits, lower thirds, informative text burned yep. and burned in subtitles and a clean is, and a clean one without it. Oh yeah, yeah. And then clean exclude the burned in subtitles, but. Include the title cards, credits, lower thirds, and the informative <laughs> text. And then the third version is text list, which is elements to be included at the end, end of the text that are clean video or as a separate feature file. So it's yep. like, oh. Yep. Yeah, and then you have to do it again for the, all the trailers. Because and don't, and don't forget about the audio, the 5.1 mix, oh, the gosh. stems. <laughs> so if, 
I would, I would, I would highly recommend right now to anyone who's listening. If you're doing your own audio mix, don't even. I, I highly recommend don't even attempting a five one unless you 100 percent know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You are an audio person, mm-hmm. but don't don't start YouTube and how to do a five point one mix no. and make it correct for it. Don't no. do not do that. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, yes, but you're right. We had to do all that as well. Five so. one, and then you got to split, and then don't forget the M and E. Uh, yep. music and effects and dialogue tracks, all those have to be separate. And if they're five, one, you got to do them separate for that. So that's like 16, like 15, 20 files alone. Just on, Oh, it gets, it gets stupid. <laughs> exactly. And not all distributors want that. Like the early distributor we were working with for, uh, Amazon iTunes and stuff like that. They were like, give us a ProRes file and an SRT for the subtitles and we're sure. good. Mm-hmm. But the Orchard, which is essentially like uh, Sony's top level digital dis- di- distributor arm, mm-hmm. yeah, like they want everything you said. They want all of it. And like, look, they're not gonna. They will. You're gonna miss your distribution window if you don't get this stuff. Oh, absolutely. This yeah. stuff is huge. So I highly recommend. Um, the the workflow I found to work, and this would probably help your listeners too, is find a good post house that can handle the heavy heavy lifting, yeah. um, and do all of the offline edit yourself. That's what I have found to be the most cost effective mm-hmm. um, or hire someone like Alex Ferrari <laughs> who does that stuff anyways. Right. Um, so yeah, that's because that's all of these headaches, I was able just to forward the email to the post house and they just took care of it. Right. If you have, you definitely get professionals to do it. And by the way, the list used to be worse because then you used to have yeah. the HDSRs uh, and then how, how you lay out the audio tracks on the HDSR tape. Then for foreign, Ugh. you have to have uh, digibetas. And then you got to do standard defs, and then you got to do a pan and scan and a crop version. And then, oh even worse, you go down to beta SP for some other places. Yeah, I haven't had any of those tape deliverables in a while, but that's what it used to be, in addition to everything you just said. Oh, and also sometimes they want a Dolby mix, which is a mix that goes onto a tape, but you have to rent the Dolby system. So it compresses the 5 1 into two tracks. And then it could decode that on the other end by a decoder by Dolby. Oh, dude, it just gets – Oh, my god! Oh, it just gets cray-cray. And then on top of all of that, then that's just the physical deliverables. Let's not even get into E&O insurance. Oh, and, yeah. I got, the, I, have that, I, got a, I got a rapid fire list for that because <laughs> I also didn't have this. Oh, okay, I shouldn't say I didn't have this because that makes us look very unprofessional. I yeah. do, but you have to dig it up. I got You have to have E&O, sure. a chain of title agreement, chain of title proof of payment, copyright notice, copyright registration, copyright report, all of which are different, by the way. Yep. T- title report, certificate of origin, instrument of transfer, residual documents. And then um, if, if anyone's doing a documentary out there or using stock footage, Ooh. log it. For like, where did you download it from? Wh- who is the author? Like, you have to and where are the that. rights and where are the rights and who do you have the rights to and do you have theatrical rights? Oh, to worldwide ugh. rights and you're, oh, yeah. you're in big trouble if you don't. Yes, it becomes a problem. So that is a small lesson, uh, boys and girls, on <laughs> deliverables and and going through all of that. Now, let me ask you: when you were doing your Fathom events. Um, did you and did Kirk ever go out to any of them? Did was it like in a like did he show up? Or did you guys sell anything at those uh, places as well? Like did you sell any other um, you know ancillary products, t-shirts, hats, whatever? So that's actually a really clever idea. I should probably write that down. <laughs> Tell Kirk uh, he could have that uh-oh. one for free. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so this one was a little tricky. So I convinced him this time to do a pre-recorded intro and a pre-recorded outro. Mm-hmm. So none of it was actually quote live, mm-hmm. which means we would have been able to do what you just said. So maybe next time, mm-hmm. but um, no, so we were in 756 theaters the first night we mm-hmm. went, we had like a party here, like a little rap party. And then, you know, the whole crew went. Mm-hmm. And then that night I had to film people at the movie theater. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could run back to the office that night, edit a new trailer to upload to all the media outlets that same night so it, i could have like audience reactions mm-hmm. because then they can they needed to run that to promote the encore dates wow. um which i would re- recommend uh if you, if you ever go this route or anyone does a fathom absolutely do that because it gets fathom fired up that knows that you liked working with them and there's a much higher chance they're going to give you another date and they and they are always looking for collaborators are always looking for for product and, and movies that can draw an audience yeah i, I would um privy to say that they are changing a lot of things 
Mm-hmm. And I mean that in a really good way. Mm-hmm. A thing that I just saw them doing right now that I think is genius is they're looking at high level TV shows mm-hmm. and they're convincing the networks to do um, their finales or premieres yeah. as Fathom events um, a day or two before they're on TV. And they're really doing a good job of making it fun. Like they're doing, I'm sure, I don't know if you saw the, the thing they're doing for The Walking Dead. No, I didn't know that. So, I know they did something for the Game of Thrones, I thought I heard a while ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I didn't see that one, but the, I don't watch the walking dead, but I saw the big, I mean, they had a big cutout poster in the theater and it was mm-hmm. fathom was posted all over it mm-hmm. and it's genius. Basically you can like come in character and there's going to be live, um, or, you know, quote live, mm-hmm. uh, like Q and A's with the actors and the producers and the directors, a little behind the scenes featurette. And then boom, they're going to, you know, play the season finale of the walking dead, mm-hmm. which is going to go straight into the season premiere of fear the walking dead which so you're seeing a lot more of that so they're really open Mm -hmm. to to not just doing opera so (laughs) right like you're i I think you're going to see a lot of indie films well actually you you should um you should look up that primal rage movie just Mm -hmm. if you type in primal rage fathom Mm -hmm. you should go down the rabbit trail because that would be closer to yours not that yours is a horror slasher Mm -hmm. but they did an indie film and they had a full fathom release i think they were in like 300 400 theaters and now do they okay so just out of curiosity though do they i mean who pays for the posters in the theaters do they, does uh, Fathom they do, do that they, Fathom yeah, does. You, you don't have to pay for that um however it's going to be the chances of you having a poster in theaters are a lot slimmer we got lucky because i mean kirk had done six i mean he'd done let's see monumental unstoppable revive us and he had done four fathom events sure so he had he had a pretty big you know relationship with them sure but sure. yeah you no know, uh, the pna the traditional pna uh, you're, uh, they'll take care of it for their, for like their little world that they're in, mm-hmm. but you're not going to see a poster for your movie in theaters. Most likely more, sli- but, but then, but they will be running, uh, ads. They'll be running ads before. Um, yeah. So for, and, and they figured that out for you, which is kind of nice. So connect, um, the trailer for that ran before a lot of like family films, like the greatest show. This actually was cool. So Fathom worked a deal out with so pretty much every theater that was showing The Greatest Showman. Mm-hmm. Um, Connect a trailer for Connect ran before it. Oh, that's um, awesome! Which really worked out because The Greatest Showman had a, a super leggy uh, release run, so, right? Yeah. So yeah. So if you did on the uh, Corner of Ego and Desire, I could see it being run at like you know any. I, I don't know if there's any romance in your thing, but it seems to be kind of a buddy movie. Would you say that's accurate? It's it's a it's it's aimed at the indi- at, at the film industry without question. So it would have to be yeah comedies. It would be under in front of a comedy without yeah. Question. So you would get you'd probably be exactly. So there you go. Which is always in theaters. So they'd probably put yours in front of as many comedies and uh, dramedies that they could. That would be that's uh, very interesting. Very very interesting. I might uh, I might I might think about that. The risk is significantly lower than doing a traditional theater release because a traditional theater release, just to get there, you're out between three and five million. And I believe three to five million dollars gets you like three to four hundred theaters for like a week. Right, exactly. And if you don't know if you don't know what you're doing, uh, you're you're done. You're done. Yeah, it's just so But there's other so, options as well, like tug and other things like that that you can do that can kind of like go out and and you can like build out a, a, a screen by screen theatrical release, you know, but this is a lot bigger. This is a bigger thing. You know, you, you've got a company behind you. You've got free, basically free marketing inside the theaters um, and you're doing a 300 screen release. That's pretty massive. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, um, like after the show, I could probably give you some contact information. You sure, could, no problem. I appreciate that. If that works. But th- I think there's, uh, I mean, I saw your trailer and it definitely feels like it would be part of that part of that niche so yeah i yeah, mean very cool the, but the big thing that i would say to, to take away is it, it is possible you, you gotta have a niche like which you've already preached on before like you've got to have a niche target audience like yeah, who so, yeah, who the, is this for yeah the, in other words li, you know everyone listening <laughs> if you make a movie that's a broad comedy that's not this is not going to work they're not going to take on a broad comedy with no stars yeah, no uh, way. And you shouldn't. You probably shouldn't be making that movie, anyways. Not on the indie world. <laughs> <laughs> you should be doing more of a niche situation where you can then really focus. Um, you know, I knew my audience. I built Ego and Desire strictly for my audience, which are filmmakers uh, and filmmakers and cinephiles. So those right. are two fairly large niches. Um, not huge mm. in the grand w- scope of the world, but they are they are niches. 
Um, I think they're. I think those niches are a lot bigger than I realized, though, because um, so I'm on your page too. I'm looking at these master classes. Yeah. Oh I mean, God, they're, they're making just tons of money. Yeah, and I mean, it's Ron Howard teaching how to direct. Like that's a v- extremely specific audience. By the way, that's and, the best of all of them. Okay, I need to watch that you one. I was got to watch that one. <laughs> all growing up, I was called Ron Howard. So. <laughs> we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Ron Howard's, by the way, anyone listening, if you're going to buy a master class on directing, I know Scorsese's there and I know Werner Herzog and stuff and Spike Lee. Uh, no, it's Ron Howard. Ron <laughs> Howard's is, you literally sit there for, f- I think, an hour of the master class and watch him direct a scene from Frost Nixon on the fly in in every which budget range you can think of. So he does the big budget where he's got the, the steady cam and he's got all these other cameras and you you know he's got time all the way down to like, we're going to do this indie style. One camera, how much coverage can we get in this amount of time? Let's go. And he and you see the man just think on his feet. It was magical to watch. Yeah, I want. I want. I really want to take that course. The, <laughs> uh, but I think the fact that they even exist, and I think their budget, because a buddy of mine worked on them. Oh, they're, I, they're obscene. I think they're around a million, right? In uh, that, they, in, yes, about a million you know? per, and I know they pay. To my knowledge, they pay like two fifty to five hundred thou up front, and then they get a piece of everything off the back end, small piece after that. Um, oh, so the, so they spend between one point two and one point five. No, just just uh, like the production of it. I think the production of it is not a mill, but I think the the total, including the payment to the to the instructor and the production. Pro, I mean, I could say that production is probably they're gonna they shoot for two or three days, um, probably about half mill. And they, right. and it's because they, they've got like an insane director and I mean they look gorgeous and there's and, and that includes post like you know trying to get all the post of it all done and all that stuff so yeah they, they they're spending a lot they're spending it's, a lot so it just kind of proves your point like niche niche audiences are worth it especially long haul because I could see something like on the corner of ego and desire like that will you, at least from the trailer I saw mm-hmm. you shot it semi timeless. Like so, I mean, next year you could probably still watch it as a filmmaker and still get inspired and still feel like you're one of those people. You could probably do it again next year. Yeah, next year. Uh, yeah, the, the, yeah. Other than them, you know, all the signs that say Sundance 2018. Well, other, than- uh, <laughs> other than that, it is timeless. Uh, you know, that's the only thing that kind of dates the movie is that they, you know, there's 2018 everywhere uh, while we're shooting, but there's nothing I could. Maybe I could go in digitally and remove all that later. Uh- <laughs> Each year, 19, 20. Every, yeah, I just I just constantly go in and paint everything out um but very cool so now what's the next step in the distribution plan for the movie is it going to now go through after this next encore is it going to go st- down traditional distribution path which is svod tvod so TV. multiple things happen and this is also worth noting for any of you guys so any of your listeners who like don't even like kirk cameron or don't, or like just don't want to do anything related to family or faith this is mm-hmm. still something you should know is uh, if an audience shows up for a movie it's because they liked liked the movie or topic or the something about it. So give them, I mean, make quality stuff for that world anyways. Like there's a reason indie film hustle is not just a podcast. Mm-hmm. Like, like I'm, Hey, I, I really like hanging out with Alex and the way he talks to these people. I'm going to go to the website. Whoa, look, there's videos. There's all this stuff. That's you. Filmmakers need to be thinking like that more. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't just mean you make a shirt. Like <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it might be, it might be appropriate for your film. Like a uh, corner of ego and desire even your example, I mean, that's a cool name. So mm-hmm. I could see that like even just being printed on a shirt. So here's here's the next path for us. So we do the documentary. This has gotten parents fired up. Like I talked to a 10-year-old on the phone for about half an hour. Um, made me cry. I'm going to try not to cry now. Okay. But he, he, no tears, he, no tears. His, his mom is friends with my mom. And my mom said, hey, my friend Lindy, like her son wants to call you. He went and saw the movie and loved it. I'm like, oh, is he like older? Like, no, he's 10. I'm like, what? Mm-hmm cool. And he called and he was just like, man, like seeing how a dad really cares. And, you know, I want to be a dad like that one day and understanding the, understanding the brain and knowing like, wow, like I got to be careful how much I'm on this phone. It just kind of blew my mind. That's awesome. And so, and so his grandma was just like, yeah, we went, we went to both nights. And then, so that you got to think like, okay, how can I help these people more? Like if they liked more, if they loved ego and desire, if they loved this is me, like what can I do to give them more of this world? So what we're doing for distribution further down the line, uh, step one, there's an e-course coming out. Mm-hmm. And the my friend yep. next to me right now is actually editing it like mm-hmm. right this second. Sure. And, 
And so that's going to be available on um, engageyourkids.com. Uh-huh. And and so that's not the movie, but it's an e-course around the movie. It's There's a it. lot of new content. It's a lot. It's more money than a movie. It's like 35, 40 bucks. But we found really good success with that because oh, parents, yeah. parents see the movie. They're like, all right, I want to get more hands, hands on on this. And then boom, there you are to offer an e-course, six or seven lessons hosted with Kirk and some experts. And they're going to get really specific about Instagram and their phones. And here's exact guidelines you can do. And here's the right ages. And, you know, hey, you know, your, ki- your kid's 13 years old. This just happened in their brain that you should be aware of. And they're going to be start noticing these types of things. Like, that's, how- that's, that's brilliant. It's, it's kind of like my example of that I always use the vegan chef movie. Yeah, the vegan chef. <laughs> the vegan chef, which I got to make one day. But the vegan right. chef, the vegan chef movie, like if they like the movie, they go find out about the movie and all of a sudden, oh, look, there's cooking classes. Yes. On how to make, you know, X amount of, you know, how to how to make tofu taste like steak, you know, <laughs> whatever that no, seriously, is. Seriously, that's exactly right. That's huge. Like that's if huge. someone showed up for the vegan chef, the movie, like I, I feel like. um, Even <sighs> if they watched it for free on Hulu. It's, exactly. It doesn't even matter. It's it's a it's a loss leader. It's a lead magnet for them to come into your world. And once they're in your world, and you if you have other things that you could offer them that is of value to them, then that and you'll make much more money off ancillary. As as 100%. as as George Lucas says, the money is in the in the lunch boxes. Hundred <laughs> percent. One. It's and like, it's so I think people, myself included, have so often thought about that in terms of Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Like, well, duh, lightsabers and star, you yeah. know, blaster pistols. Sure, and, sure, sure. Of course, it's like, well, think about that for like. There's tons of movies, like that that I love. Um, mm-hmm. That you just have to figure out what is the ancillary product that makes sense for this. That's that's like a benefit. Right. Um, like I could see. Um, uh, on the corner of ego and desire, navigating the Sundance Film Festival, or on the corner of ego oh, and desire, how to like, make a, how to make a how to make a, a micro budget feature film. Yeah, da, da, boom. Da. That's exactly. So we're doing the e course, mm-hmm. and that's already it just launched actually today at engageyourkids.com dot com for some shameless promotion there. Absolutely. And then the the they're doing because um, there's a big uh, schools care a lot about this topic. So the DVD home entertainment release is in June. Mm-hmm. So before that. We're doing a special the- uh, not theater, uh, I don't know what you call it, uh, institution release. So we're, we're selling, um, Provident Films is working with uh, both churches and schools, um, homeschool networks, private schools, charter schools to give them advanced screenings. And then those education uh, sectors pay for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically they can do their own screening. Nice. So really that's almost three distribution models off the top. You've got a secondary, I don't know if you want to call it a theater market or what, but it's like a mm-hmm. secondary big screen market, mm-hmm. um, an e-course, mm-hmm. and then the home entertainment. And then, then you've got SVOD, TVOD, uh, and all the other traditional, and just DVD sales in general and all that kind oh, of Yeah, stuff. which for us will all hit in June pretty much simultaneously. Right. We stay away from uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime. For a while. It, for a while. I would recommend, so basically at the top level you got theaters and then you have physical DVDs, and then you have um, uh, 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 on-demand, paid on-demand, and yeah. then you have Amazon Prime and iTunes and Google Play, and then way down at the bottom, you have Netflix and the Amazon Prime. That, that's, and Hulu or something and like Hulu. that. And Hulu. Yeah, you just got to be careful how quick you jump to that because you can't – It's once you've gone to that ring in the ladder – You're done. You're, yeah, that's it. And for some people, that's that's fine. Oh, no, Dude. look. You know, If you, you offer this movie to Netflix and Netflix, like I'm going to give you two million bucks for this. Yeah, totally different story. Then <laughs> you're like, happens. then you're like, um, well, how much money are we going to make on going the traditional route with all these DVDs and stuff, or should we just slap it over to Netflix right now? Exactly. You have to, or if you've decided as a team, like our ancillary products are so strong, it's worth it to us to have this right. easier for people to see to sell this stuff. Right, exactly, and it all depends on what your the end goal of your movie is. Is if it's if it's to make a lot of money, that's one way. If it's a, if it's to also make money and help people, that's another thing. There's exactly. a, all sorts yeah. of different ways of, of going about it. But uh, but this has been really educational. I'm I'm really glad you uh, you jumped on the on the um, on the podcast, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. It's now super I've got, fun. Now I've got a few questions I ask all my filmmakers, all, all my uh, my guests. So are you ready for the rapid fire questions? Yes, fire away. What advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Um, just start doing it. <laughs> you know what? That is the most common response. Everyone's like, there's, just go there's, make a movie. Just go make a movie. 
there's um, short films or Poopod. I would say that Kirk asked me to join his team because he saw my short films. Mm-hmm. So I don't Poopod them entirely. Right. Um, oh, me too. I mean, I got big jobs because of short films I've done, but... Yeah, you did uh, You did one that was huge. What was it called? Uh, Red Princess Blues or Broken, one of those two. I think it was Broken that I right, saw. Right, right. Yeah, that, cool. that opened up, but that was also 2005. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now, back to the show. So it was a okay. whole other world when I made that short. I would not do that today, and nor will it be that successful today because it, it was just uh, had, you know just different times. But in today's world, go make a feature. Yeah, go go do it right now. Grab your friends and be prepared for it to suck. One of the um, and be okay with that. The mm-hmm. biggest one of the biggest things I advice I would also give to is um, even though this is going to sound backhanded at the same time, write your script. And if you find yourself skipping over a portion of the script and in the back of your mind, you just say, oh, we'll figure that out on set or, oh, we'll figure that out on post. That's a humongous red flag and go back to that part of your script and fix it. I'm sure there's someone listening right now who's been doing that. (laughs) Don't do that. You're only only allowed to say I'll fix it in post if you are the person who's capable of fixing it in post. Yeah, don't. And then (laughs) because I wrote uh, Connect had a a pretty script, a pretty strict script because – this is a lot of information. Mm-hmm. I want to get it out in an hour. I want people to talk to a, a brain surgeon first, then parents, then a therapist. Like there's a very specific reason. Mm-hmm. But there was a, there was a particular interview, and every time in the script, I breezed over it. Like yeah, I'm sure that'll work, mm-hmm. and I'm sure you can guess which interview landed up on the cutting room floor mm-hmm. and wasted us a lot of time. So and money, get out, right. <laughs> yeah. So get out, make the film, be okay with it not being good, and then go make another one. Mm-hmm. Like Fair. if you want to, if you want to break into the business, do it now. And for the love of all that is holy, do not take out a loan to go to film school. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to take out a loan, at least go make a movie with it. But don't even do that. <laughs> yeah, but that's. <laughs> but yeah. don't do that either. <laughs> yeah, read read the 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 the, the um uh, I don't know if you wrote a book, Kevin Smith's story about clerks. Oh, of course, great. Book. Yeah, read that. Read um you know the Rebel without the a Rebel crew. without a crew. Get inspired by those, but. Do not do those financial models. <laughs> There's like, a different world, man. Those are the '90s. You, you know, you can't you can't think about becoming. You know, you can't go down the same path that Spielberg and Scorsese did. Like that, those paths don't exist anymore. No, they they don't. Which is probably why the Scorsese masterclass might be a little harder to translate to today. Right. But um, it was it is pretty good though. I, I mean, he does talk about some cool stuff. But yeah, Ron Howard was Ron Howard. Just watch Ron Howard. So that's there's there's some advice there. If you want to break into the business today, and honestly. You per, if if you're listening to this and you live in Montana, you don't have to move closer to LA, but it's highly recommended. Um, um, from someone who lived in Miami for a lot of my life, uh, the second I got here, I was like, "Oh, I get it now." Yeah, it's 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 hard to explain, Alex. Like I live in Ventura, um, which is just beautiful, but I'm I still have to commute to LA to get some stuff. I mean, when yeah. you're down here, there's everyone's in on it. Everyone. Everyone's trying to hustle. Mm-hmm. There's equipment houses i mean down here you can get an ari alexa with like some oh, lenses for oh. like nothing oh yeah um like so yeah if, if you're older i'd say get to la find some roommates start writing and start shooting there you go sorry i'll stop talking <laughs> <laughs> now, now what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn whether in the film business or in life oh boy okay um i knew you were gonna ask that so it's it's two things one, when I was in film school, I, I, I started only DPing because I thought I didn't, I hadn't lived enough life mm-hmm. to, di- to direct something. Mm-hmm. And I would say the lesson is you will never have learned enough to do anything. Mm-hmm. Well, you're, you're never going to, this is a big philosophical thing here. I'm sure. learning because I have two kids. You're never going to, quote, be ready to have kids. No. You're never, and, <laughs> no. and you will never, quote, be ready to direct that film you you won't that won't happen so what you need to do is you just need to like tighten up your knuckles and just go do it and i'm looking back and i could have i mean when you when you don't have kids Mm -hmm. and you're not married i mean you can sleep whenever and wherever yeah you have so much freedom yes you need to grab a camera and you need to start shooting you need to stay up till three o'clock in the morning Mm -hmm. writing Mm -hmm. you need to read as much about listen to the indie film hustle from beginning (laughs) to end 
that's I would say that's the biggest thing, and I'm still learning it. Like, try to always go in a little above your head because that's the only way you're going to move forward. And it's also, I mean, I remember before I met my wife and before I had kids, I mean, I I would work 12, 15 hours a day, sleep four hours and, you know, do things that you just can't do now. Just can't nope. do it. You know, life yeah. is different now. Exactly. Um, all right. Now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Oh, that's easy. Hook, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, and Once. Once. Oh, good. I love, I love Hook. I, love I would Hook. say, I would say you need to watch Hook to remember that it's okay to feel like a kid forever. Yep. Um, and it's just to see how, like, I mean, to me, that's like the quintessential large budget studio adventure film of the nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say watch Scott Pilgrim to get inspired that you can blend genres sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, it works seldomly, but for me, it, it worked very well. In it, Scott Pilgrim. It, it worked story. very well, not financially well, but well, artistically without question. <laughs> <laughs> right, it, the box office not financially, but long right. long term it did. Yeah, absolutely, it, absolutely. It took a it took a long time. It, it's one of those movies that took a while to everyone go. Hey, that's a really good movie. <laughs> exactly, um, and then I would say watch once uh, to get fired up to do a movie for no money. Oh God, because yeah. I mean that movie was made for nothing on an XD cam and looks like crap. And I mean they were at the Academy Awards accepting um, you best know song. best best song. <laughs> It was, yeah. it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Um, all right, cool. And um, where can people find more out more about the movie and about you? So the movie is connectmovie.com. Mm-hmm. Um, that's being updated. So yeah. And uh, for me, you can just email me at Caleb, C A L E B, at Caleb Price Productions. And then the only social media I'm on now, especially after doing that movie, is uh, Twitter. Uh, okay. So that's P as in precision, F as in fortune, Caleb, C A L E B. So PF Caleb. Caleb, and thank you so much for being on, man. You dropped a bunch of knowledge bombs on the tribe today, so I, I truly appreciate it, man. Thank you, Alex. This was a lot of fun. I want to thank Caleb for coming on and dropping some nice knowledge bombs on the uh, on the tribe today. Uh, Caleb, thank you again, man. And, and, you know, this is just another revenue stream. This is just another way to make money with your movie. It's not going to be for everyone. Not everyone's going to get in, but it's just something I want you guys to be aware of because if your movie is the proper fit for this, this is an amazing opportunity to generate revenue for your film. Now, if you want links to anything we talked about in this episode, head over to IndieFilmMuzzle.com forward slash 245. And if you haven't already, please head over to FilmmakingPodcast.com and leave us a good review on the show. It really, really, really helps us out a lot, and I really would appreciate it. And also, if you guys like screenwriting, don't forget about Bulletproof Screenplay, a new podcast that I launched around three months ago, and it's already in the top five of all screenwriting podcasts on iTunes. So thank you for all the tribe members that already signed up. But if you're interested in signing up for that podcast, head over to screenwritingpodcast.com. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I will talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.